All right, guys, in this month's video, we're going to be discussing what a Spring Smasher is. We're going to see if I can build one for under 150 bucks. And if successful, I'm going to tell you how you can enter to win the Smasher that we build in this video. Let's go. For any of our non-oval track viewers, the definition of a Spring Smasher is just a Spring Raider that you can put a coil over in. First, we need to talk about what a Spring Smasher can do and what it can't do. For some unknown reason, a lot of magic and unearned valor gets attributed to these machines. In reality, Spring Smashers can measure a load or a force at a given distance, and they can help you unload the right front spring a little easier. That's kind of it. Something that really grinds my gears is that Spring Smashers use the word wheel load. To me, this is either deceitful marketing or ignorance. I'm not sure which is worse. Wheel load takes into consideration motion ratio, the sum of all inelastic weight transfer, shock valving, and a myriad of other variables that this machine simply doesn't measure. Knowing your individual wheel loads would be invaluable information. But because there's so many unknown variables in the equation, it would be almost impossible to figure out. What these machines should say is the far less important term, spring load, because that's what they're actually measuring. If I had to guess why, as a sport, we've become obsessed with spring smashers, I would say that it's because A, chassis builders and gurus love making things seem more complicated than they are, and B, in all fairness, it is a slightly less arbitrary way of looking at spring loads contribution to dynamic wedge. But as we all know, there are a bunch of other contributing factors and spring load is just one small piece of the puzzle. But I digress. Racing is and always will be a game of efficiently turning a finite amount of resources into as successful of a race team as possible. For me personally, I can think of better ways to spend $7,000 that would help my race team more than a Spring Smasher would. I would imagine other teams feel the same way. So what I'm going to do is attempt to build a Spring Smasher for $150 bucks and some scrap material I have in my shop, and then post links to everything I bought along with all the design files for anyone to access for free on my website. There are plenty of people trying very diligently to increase the cost of racing. Hopefully I can make a small dent in the other direction. Okay, so to build a Spring Smasher, we need to figure out how we want to measure a force, how we want to measure a distance, how to change the distance via some linear actuation, and then build a frame or a chassis to hold everything rigid. Oh yeah, and most importantly, design a spring unloader attachment. To measure spring load, we're going to be using an S-type load cell. According to this Amazon ad, this particular load cell is good for up to 2200 pounds and has high accuracy, as can be seen by it being mentioned twice in the title. Yes, the right front does see a little bit more than 2200 pounds of spring load, but things like this are generally designed with some factor of safety, so we could probably safely send it up to 3,000 pounds. This next part, in my opinion, is the hardest part about building a spring smasher, and that is taking the analog voltage output from the load cell, amplifying it and turning it into a digital signal so that you can apply a calibration curve, then take your force measurement and output it to a digital display. Traditionally, you would have to shell out a lot of money to avoid having to do these pretty complex steps. But deep down the rabbit hole on page four of my Amazon search, I found this little guy. It does everything we need. It amplifies, converts to a digital signal, and reads to a digital display, all embedded in this little chip. Once you give it a zero point and a known value, it'll extrapolate a linear calibration curve. All right, so that's the hardest part done, and we're $46 into it. Now we have to figure out how to measure a distance. Done. 
And for anybody that thinks that this isn't good enough because you need to be able to measure to the thousandth of an inch, I assure you there is nothing on a dirt light model outside of the drivetrain that needs to be measured within a thousandth of an inch. It always cracks me up hearing people rattle off their spring load numbers to the thousandth of an inch when they drive cars that have tires that can do this. But I digress again. Next, we need to figure out how to compress the spring and shock and control the distance part of the equation. I thought about using a bottle jack here, but unfortunately, I'm lazier than I am cheap. I needed something that could travel the shock through its range of motion with the push of a button. And then I found this. It has a load rating of three tons and it has a range of motion of 10 inches which, if I get clever with the design, should be plenty. Speaking of which, here's what I came up with for the design. The great thing about CAD is you can design the entire thing in the computer first to get all of your measurements right and make sure it's all gonna work like you want. And then you can go out and build it. If you didn't watch my previous YouTube video, I highly recommend checking it out because it goes over some CAD and it also talks about plasma cutting and 3D printing, both of which we are going to use a decent amount to finish this smasher up. The electronic scissor jack is going to be powered by a cordless DeWalt battery and basically it's just going to push up on a ram that's held in place by two 3D printed bushings. I designed this little control panel that's going to hold the computer chip, the buttons that control the actuation, and my touchscreen, aka iPhone. And the last thing I want to highlight is the spring unloader attachment. It attaches to one of the uprights, and if you pull one of the pins out, it'll fold out of the way. Alright, enough dicking around on the computer. Let's go sling some metal. First, I had to cut all of the tubing to length. I ended up going with 2 inch, 8 inch wall, square tubing, mainly because I had a stick of it left over in my shop from a prior project. Then it was time for welding. It's helpful to have a flat surface, some clamps, and some squares to make sure everything stays according to the drawing. I had to make a quick run to the bank to get some rolls of dimes to fill the welding machine back up. But after the refill, she laid some pretty stacks. Next up was plasma cutting. As I mentioned in my last video, plasma cutting can be extremely useful, especially for projects like these. I needed to cut out the upper trusses that held in the load cell two mid plates that located the central ram that we were going to use to push the shock and spring up and down, and also the shock mounts that were going to hold the shocks in place. Next I made some shock pins which I had entirely too much fun building. I used my DeWalt lathe to taper the ends down and then I 3D printed some knobs to screw onto the end of the bolts that I cut down. After a quick spray bomb job, it was time for wiring and final assembly. I took the DeWalt battery mount that I designed and printed in my last video and wired it up to the electric scissor jack. If you wanted to, you could use the controller that came with the jack to actuate the ram up and down. But since I'd already dismembered the controller to cut off the power indicator light so that it wouldn't drain the battery, I decided to go ahead and order two push buttons that I could plumb into my control panel so I could actuate the RAM from there. I took some of the leftover wire from the load cell and soldered it to the board so I could use my own buttons. While I was waiting for the control panel to finish up 3D printing, I made the center to center pointer I planned on using with another 3D printed part and a rivet pin that I ground into a point. And I also fabbed up the spring unloader attachment. The last big hurdle was building the RAM. The problem I had is that 
A fully extended left rear shock can be over 27 inches long, and a fully compressed right front shock can be under 14 inches long. And if you recall, I only have 10 inches of travel on my electric scissor jack. I ended up using telescoping tubes so that I could change the height of the ram so that I could position my 10 inches of travel over three different ranges. Lastly, I cut the threads off of an extension that came with the jack kit and welded it to the bottom of the ram so I could screw it to the top of the jack. The control panel finally finished up printing so I could start wiring up the buttons and start wiring up the screen. The only mistake I made is I was planning on using a micro USB phone charger to power the chip and power the load cell. But because I tried to get cute and countersink the chip into the control panel, it made it so that a micro USB charger wouldn't actually fit into the port. So I cobbled together some phone chargers so that it allowed me to use my phone as a battery pack, which ended up actually working better because I was planning on using my phone as my touchscreen and graphing display anyways. And you wouldn't have to plug it into a wall socket for anything. After the control panel was finished being installed and after I finished building this little front cover plate, this thing really started to look sexy. At this point, all I had really left to do was calibrate it. First, I had to apply the adhesive measuring tape. I took a load stick that was exactly 20 inches center to center and put it in the machine. Then I stuck the tape on so that the pointer was pointed exactly at the 20 inch mark. The instructions on the chip I was using were pretty awful, so it took me a minute to figure out what sequence of buttons I needed to press to get it to work like I needed. But like I said earlier, basically we needed to give it a zero point and we needed to give it a known value. I had a spring setup built that I knew was exactly 950 pounds at 20 inches. So I put that setup in the smasher, ran it to 20 inches, and then told the chip that that was 950 pounds. I then wanted to cycle the machine just to make sure that everything worked, which I was fully confident that it would. Next, I needed to confirm the spring unloader attachment worked. This spring unloader was designed specifically for Bilstein shocks, but will probably work with other brands that use a similar snap ring style bottom spring perch. Lastly, I made a spreadsheet that allows me to graph my spring loads, just so that I can say my spring smasher is a touchscreen graphing spring smasher. So yeah, it actually came out better than I expected. It looks and works great, and it squeaked in just under budget. Like I mentioned earlier, I'm going to link all of the design files and all of the products I used to put this smasher together for free to view on my website. I really hope to encourage some of you to try to build this on your own and hopefully put your own spin on it. But additionally, I'm going to build another Spring Smasher that's identical to this one and give this one away to one of the lucky viewers of this video. To enter to win, you must do two things. One, you have to be subscribed to this channel, and two, you have to buy something off the website. For anyone that just wants to enter and doesn't want to purchase a hat or a shirt, I made a separate ticket that you can buy that just throws your name in the hat. We'll pick a winner one month after the upload date of this video, and we'll let you guys know through the email that you use to order with. Hopefully you guys enjoyed the video. Hopefully you learned something and we'll see you this weekend at Eldora Speedway in three weekends at Charlotte or in the next video.